Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers um, for inviting me both to participate in this project and also to, to speak at, at the conference. Um, the focus on my, of my brief presentation is going to be on the role of the European Union, but some of the considerations that I'll make may also extend to other um, European organizations and their potential for, for intervention in, in this sphere. The reason for my focus on the EU is because this is where I believe that um, a protocol of the nature as is being discussed with this project is more urgently needed. And part of my starting point is also the fact that the EU has so far been reluctant to adopt any kind of initiative in, in this area and also the fact that it takes quite a pragmatic approach to taking action in in a specific area and um, tends to only do so when it sees that there's a significant gap or a significant um, problem um, which can have wider impact on you know, the cooperation between member states and integration that therefore needs needs to be needs to be addressed. So my argument is that um, in this case the EU urgently needs to intervene in this area because its position or its lack of position um, results in a significant gap in the EU legal framework, which is resulting in a significant erosion of democracy and human rights in the European sphere. And it's also starting to threaten to a degree or have an impact on the kind of trust and cooperation of different states with the institutions and all for different member states um, themselves. So where does this gap come from? Why does this gap I, I believe this gap um, comes from, on the one hand, the narrative of how the EU presents itself as a supranational organization, as something more than a union of, of states. And I think this then creates a series of expectations on the part of sub-state nations, on the part of sub-state units, when they begin these types of, of processes. So examples of what I'm referring to in relation to this narrative it's the reference, for example, to the foundation values of the Union, so democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights. Also, the various references that we find to the Union of Peoples, not so much a union of, of states, so the reference to peoples as European peoples as a constitutive element of, of the Union, and therefore the EU is a democracy where different European peoples can exist in a single um, European multinational polity. Finally, also, the final issue I want to highlight is, you know, the important role of European citizenship as, you know, establishing, creating rights for um, citizens of member states, but which are derived directly from, from the treaties, and therefore this idea of European citizenship as an incipient um, European um, demos. So all these kind of supranational elements of the narrative create these um, expectations in the case of these conflicts, in the case of, of these processes. But what we see then um, in the reaction or in the response of the European Union when these conflicts arise, when these processes do arrive, is that in this specific area, it still very much behaves like a union, a union of states. So in its response, what we can see is that it tends to treat these conflicts, these processes as simply an internal constitutional issue of the member states. It doesn't provide a clear legal answer to the legal questions that arise from the European dimension of, of these um, conflicts. And also so far, it has refused to intervene even in cases of serious violations of human rights or democratic um, principles. So again, we see um, this clearly in the recent processes, or the recent conflicts in, in Scotland and in Catalonia, one of the most significant questions that arose in the discussions on independence was what the legal response of the European Union would be um, to um, the seceding territory remaining or not within within the European Union. And in both cases, also significant elements or significant dimensions of citizenships and citizens' rights were also um, raised, both in relationship to citizens of the sub-state union or the member states, but also in relation, for example, to citizens of other um, member states who were present in, in the territory. 
So I think this gap arises, as I said, on the one hand, from this narrative, these supranational elements of the European Union on the one hand, and the fact that um, the approach that the, co the EU has taken to um, these processes is um, not responsive to these elements, does not respond to, to these expectations, and is still very much one of a union, a union of states. So what are these um, consequences that I believe are so are so concerning and require this urgent introduction? Well, first, as I said, it's the erosion of democracy and the protection of rights in the states where um, these processes have taken place. So again, we have examples of um, Scotland and, and Catalonia. As is well known, the, the Scottish 2014 referendum was agreed between the UK authorities and um, the, the Scottish authorities. But one of the significant elements in the discussion, in the debate surrounding independence, as I've said already, was this EU dimension, was what the response of the European Union would be to independence. And the lack of clarity on the EU position generated significant uncertainty, which hijacked to a degree um, the democratic deliberation, the democratic debate, and also favoured, um, to a degree, the position of the UK um, authorities. So again, this had an impact on the democratic deliberation and ultimately the democratic decision-making in, in the referendum. If there'd been a clear protocol, if there'd been a clear um, legal framework for these issues at the level of the European Union or adopted by the European Union, this um, would, would not have happened. We see this even more clearly um, in the case of, of the Catalan process. I think we see clearly on the one hand the expectations created by the supranational um, elements of the narrative, of the, how the European Union um, presents itself. Um, we see this on the one hand on the part of the pro the pro independence movement, um, who believed with certainty that um, if their process complied with the requirements of the, of the European treaties, so if they adhere to the principles of democracy, of protection of fundamental rights, then if it was necessary, if the conflict escalated significantly, that the EU would intervene in, in some form to ensure the protection of, of democracy and fundamental rights. So we have this on the other hand. On the other hand, however, and again, Within this general framework and in relation to these expectations, the Spanish authorities, on the other hand, interpreted the lack of um, intervention of the European Union as a tacit acceptance, as a tacit endorsement of their own um, strong hand position, ultimately leading to the, the use of force. And overall, this led to a significant erosion of democracy and of human rights um, in the outcome of the conflict, many of which are still having um, a significant impact today. So we see even more clearly in this case that if there had been a clear framework of, of reference for this process, for resolving this conflict, and in particular if there had been a clear framework of reference that set out clearly how the resolution of this process, of this conflict, had to comply, what were the requirements to ensure that both sides complied with the principles of democracy and of the principles of respect for human rights, this would have avoided the escalation of the conflicts, the ultimate um, use of force, and ultimately the, the violation of, of human rights. As I highlighted already, however, the impact or the consequences of the lack of a clear legal framework, a clear um, response at the level of the European Union goes further than um, its impact on the member states involved by, by these processes. And I think this is important as another um, example to highlight why these conflicts within the sphere of the Union cannot be considered simply as internal um, constitutional issues and why this kind of wider European dimension is significant and has to be um, taken, taken into, into account. So looking at this wider impact, we see firstly that due to the lack of um, a clear legal framework, a clear legal position on these issues, various institutions um, of the European Union have been called in to consider, to respond to, to decide 
on specific aspects in relation to the process and to developments that, that followed the Commission, the Council, um, also the Court was called in to consider um, a question um, in relation to whether um, members of the, the previous Catalan government could sit on the European Parliament despite being charged with these very serious offences and resulted with three of them currently um, sitting in, in the European Parliament. And currently, therefore, the focus or the spotlight is put on the European Parliament, who will have to decide at the request of the Spanish authorities if they waive their, their immunity or, or not. So in all of these cases, we find that with the lack of a clear um, legal framework, different EU bodies and institutions are put on the spotlight when they have to engage with specific aspects relating to, to this process in a context when considering how the Spanish young process developed, how the Spanish conflict played out, which very heated and um, contested um, political um, positions. We see um, similar issues arise in relation to different um, member states, different member states of, of the European Union, again in relation to the Catalan conflict. And the clearest um, example of this, I think, is what could be described as the European arrest warrant saga. So um, many of the leaders of the Catalan, some of the leaders of the Catalan pro-independence movement, as is well known here, left Spain to avoid being prosecuted. But they were charged with serious um, offences in relation to the holding of, of the referendum. They left and travelled through different EU member states. And here... The Spanish authorities tried to get to use the European arrest warrant on various occasions to go and get other member states to send these, these individuals back. Again, we must remember that the European arrest warrant is an important element of you know, cooperation between different EU member states. It's based on the trust between um, EU um, member states. And I think what's relevant here is that so far, all of these attempts of the Spanish authorities have been unsuccessful. So the return of these affected persons, the extradition, has been denied. But we see, again, examples of different member states who are maybe not directly involved in, in the conflict. Their different institutions have to engage with and address different um, aspects that are linked to, to the conflict without um, a clear um, framework of reference which was to engage with them or address and respond to them. I think it's important to note that, I mean, this doesn't only affect um, EU institutions and the EU. For example, I think it's clear that um, many aspects of the, kind of the aftermath of the kind of Catalonian conflict, the, the Catalonian um, referendum process, will no doubt um, end up before the European Court of of human rights and here again the European Court will have to um, apply like, the rights framework of the European Convention of Human Rights to um, these issues but again without a clear protocol without a clear um, framework of, of reference um, on the wider um, issues on the wider issues involved. Therefore I mean just to end why should the EU intervene in these issues? What would the benefits be of the EU intervening in this issue? Well, firstly, to provide clarity and legal certainty on the EU and also other European organizations' approach to these issues and provide, therefore, a clear legal response. Fundamental also to provide clarity and legal certainty as to what the requirements deriving from democratic principles and um, human rights um, are for these processes, how or these conflicts, how they apply. This would lead to the avoidance of the escalations of these conflicts in member states, as both levels, the sub-state and the state institutions, would have to comply with this protocol, with this EU framework for it to be recognized. This would also avoid this detrimental impact on the EU level and on other member states and ultimately um, would provide a unity or framework for a unity of approach and therefore coordination on the part of the EU, different member states, other organizations in response to any issues arising from a particular conflict. 
Overall, I believe this would strengthen the EU um, constitutional framework and also, very importantly, extend these fundamental supranational notions and principles that I started off with. So the idea of the protection of the fundamental values of the Union, so democracy, rule of law, human rights, the understanding of the EU as a multinational, multi-level polity, and also the understanding of European citizenship as something more than just contingent on, on member states, to the sub-state level, to the sub-state nation, and to their citizens. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to any questions you may have later on in the discussion. Mm -hmm.